Hi everyone, here's the Bookemist once again, and today I'm going to film a video about an idea I've had in my mind for quite a few weeks now. I'd like to film a few videos about some books I especially love, in which I give you some very brief, very informal reader's guides. Don't take this as I'm going to tell you how you should read this book, it's more like I'm going to offer a discussion about a specific book. Uh, and please, I'm going to ask quite a few questions in this video, please do answer in the comments below, please do tell me your point of view on the issues I'm going to talk about. The point is that as a student of literature I've had to read quite a few essays, quite a few critical books on some of the books I'm going to talk about, for instance the one in this video here, and I'd like to throw some of the ideas I've read, some of the critical points of view on these books at you and see what do you think, what your reactions are. Now for this first video, what else but one of the books, well, possibly the book I have talked about the most on my channel, it's been my favorite book for quite a long time, I think it's one of you guys' favorite books because it pops up so many times in the comments to my other videos, I'm talking about Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace. And today I'm going to talk about a few issues concerning Infinite Jest, I'm going to talk about the author's intentions while writing Infinite Jest, I'm going to talk about the function of the footnotes, of the actually the end notes in the book, I'm going to talk about Infinite Jest as a choral novel, as a novel with a multiplicity of points of view, I'm going to talk about the realism in Infinite Jest, whether IJ is or is not a realist novel, and I'm going to talk about postmodernism in Infinite Jest. Is it a postmodern novel? Is it not? Who knows? Now, I'm not going to give you an introduction as far as like the plot and the character goes for two reasons. One, because I don't like to do that in videos, I think that's the pleasure of reading the book. And by the way, this video is going to be spoiler ridden, it's meant for people who have read Infinite Jest. If you haven't, don't watch this video, it's going to, to ruin the book for you. And because of also because Infinite Jest is such a fucking brick of a book that I couldn't like cram an explanation of the plot in a 30 minute video, let alone in a very short one. Um, also, for the love of God, none of the ideas I'm going to throw at you are the fruit of my genius. They are the sole stuff I've read in essays and books and whatnot. And I'm going to put a small bibliography in the description box. If you're interested in reading more about Infinite Jest, if you're interested in reading guides, in critical analysis of the book, check that bibliography out. So, let's go. If you are into literary analysis, the idea of authorial intention is anathema to you, because that is a concept that is fucked up. When you read a book, like, looking for the author intention, looking for what he or she wanted to say, you are very likely to wander away from the actual text, from the primary sources, and maybe even to see things in the book that were not there in the first place. It's one of the things you should, the, you are taught as a scholar, scholar of literature to avoid at all costs. But in cases like this one in which, like, David Foster Wallace specified what he wanted to achieve with his book, it's interesting, at least, to hear what he had to say. And when asked what he wanted to achieve with Infinite Jest, Wallace said that he wanted to do three things. He wanted to write a book that was sad, he wanted to write a book that was very American, and he wanted to write a book without a single main character. Now, Infinite Jest is incredibly sad, and you don't need a reader's guide to tell you that. It's one of the saddest books I've ever read in some ways. It features some of the most touching, most moving scenes I've ever read in fiction, which are especially stark because they contrast a lot with the more humorous parts of the book, which form a large part of the book itself. It's as American as they go, uh, both because it addresses specifically what it is to be an American, as in white and privileged, at the end of the 20th century, and also because it embraces the idea of America as the land of corporations. In the book, corporations control everything, advertisement is everywhere, the very time, the very years are advertised by a corporation or the other. It's the kind of satire that it's exactly as exaggerated as to be unrealistic, but just to the point in which it makes you wonder, well, of course, it couldn't happen or cooled it. Now, as for that third point, Infinite Jest definitely is a novel without a single main character, because sure, both Halin Candenza and Don Gatley are given, I mean, almost equivalent screen time in the novel, and they could both claim the title of main character, but also for other reasons, because the novel is structured as 
to not privilege a single character over another. There is a beautiful reflection given by the deceased father of Halin Candenza in the book by his ghost, basically, in which he talks about the TV series Cheers and he talks about all these characters in the background who never were able to say anything because they were just there to offer background to the TV series. And he said that in the movies this character, who was a director, in the movie he filmed all characters were given equal, like, equal importance. Even the background characters spoke to the same, like, level of audio level of the other characters. This is exactly, in a way, what happens in Infinite Jest. Like, at the beginning of the book, I think immediately after the first part with Hal and the interview, you have this description of a character who is an addict and who's waiting for his dose of marijuana or whatever drug is addicted to. And you don't really get who this person is, you don't really get who, who, how this person relates to the rest of the book, and you won't hear about that person for quite a few pages again, but why is that part there? It's there to show you the choral function of the novel, it's there to show you how all characters are given equal screen time, we might say. Maybe not exactly equal screen time, but equal importance. Even these secondary characters, who are not really needed for the novel, are presented as if their stories mattered. They're not just there to give you, I don't know, comic relief or something like that. Their personal tragedy, their small personal tragedy, is given the same amount of importance as that of the main characters. A similar thing happens at the end of the novel. At the end of the novel, you are craving for plot, you are craving for things to happen and for resolution. And at one point, very close to the ending of the book, you have a quite a long passage about a guy at an AA reunion talking about his experience. And this guy is no one you have ever met in the, like, 1200 pages of the novel. He is a fucking no one. And he starts talking about his life. And of course, humanly speaking, my reaction, I think many readers' reaction was who the fuck are you? Get away, I want to read about the plot. And then if you start thinking about it, you realize that, well, of course, these are all fictional characters, but if you, pro if you project this book on a more humane level, if you think about the characters as people, which is another thing you shouldn't do, but let's pretend we can do that for a second, then you are acting like a bit of an asshole, and I think the book wants you to reflect about how an asshole you will be in that case, because that person's life is important. And the fact that you don't care about it just because you want to finish your book and to get the satisfaction you get from a good plot, it's one of the ways in which we are messed up, and it's one of the things we should overcome as human beings. More about that in a second. About the end notes to the book. Why are the end notes there? The end notes are there mainly because Danny Foster Wallace, the first draft of Infinite Jazz was, I think, about 2,000 pages long, and his editor was like, no, Dave, we can't publish this. People are gonna break their arms trying to lift the book. You have to cut it. And one of the things they came up with was to remove some bits of the book and to put them in the form of end notes. So he could claim, well, of course, now we see the book is 1,000 pages long. It's fine. <clears throat> it also had like 300 pages of notes. But at the same time, the end notes also provide a new level to the book, a new level of engagement, because as everybody knows, they are kind of fucking annoying. You keep having to shift from the story you're reading to the end notes at the end of the book, which is also a physical effort because the book is very heavy and in some passages you have to do it all the time. And some of the, the fucking end notes are fucking jokes that have no sense. So you're doing it and you start thinking like, oh, fuck you, Dave Foster Wallace, why am I doing this? But then sometimes you get entire chapters in the end notes. So it's not like you can completely skip them. What's the level they add? In doing this, in this movement you keep doing from the beginning to the end of the book, the end notes mirror a game of tennis, we might say. It mirrors the movement of the ball from one player to the other. And it mirrors an active, uh, something active, an activity, something you do with another person, the author. Infinite Jest is a lot about engaging with another person, it's a lot about how books are also about discussing with other human beings. They are not passive experiences you just do for fun. They are about connecting with others again, not feeling alone. And in this active like movement, you that's part of the engagement you have with the book, in a way with the author. It's like it's an effort, just as much as the book itself is an effort, because it's not the easiest of books out there. But at the same time, it's rewarding because sometimes in the end notes you find some of the most 
like beautiful passages in the book. Some of the endnotes are key readings that make you understand some very important passages in the plot or give you crucial information about the characters. It's all part of that process. And some of you might be like, well, but Bookham is, it's not like he put the end notes there because of any genius reason. He just wanted to cram more words into his book. So why are we talking about them as if they were a work of genius? Welcome to the beautiful world of literary criticism. A new question, is Infinite Jest a realist book? Some of you might be saying, I don't give a fuck if the book is realist or not, that's just a tag. It's not, because one of the ways in which Infinite Jest wanted to re-establish this connection with, with the reader was by embracing a new form of realism. Infinite Jest was written impartially in reaction to a form of minimalism or postmodernism in American fiction, in which books were filled with ironical jokes and like jokes aimed at the reader, him or herself, but at the expense of actual enjoyment in the book. Books were more like linguistic experiments than actual novels you could enjoy, works where characters add personalities and that kinds of things. And Infinite Just Realism, Wallace himself always called himself a realist writer, is part of this politics. By writing a realist novel, by writing a new form of realism that like, looked back to classical literature in some ways, Wallace wanted to establish a new relationship with his readers. Or did he? Because you see, the characters in Infinite Jest look well-rounded and with personalities and all that, but at the same time, some of them, linguistically speaking, are kinda jokes. For instance, James Orin, James Orin in Condensa, Avril M in Condensa, their initials form the words Joy and Ami in French. And these are kind of jokes, linguistic jokes of the kind you'd expect from a guy like Thomas Pynchon, who is, at least in its early works, is the kind of guy Wallace was rebelling against, allegedly. Also, the fact that the book, the family in Condensa in the book, refers a lot, like uh, intertextualizes a lot with Hamlet, the play by Shakespeare, and also with Greek tragedy in many ways, makes them might, to some readers, make them less of an actual family and more of a literary joke or a linguistic joke of some sort. Also, yeah, Infinite Jest is a realist novel in many ways, but sometimes you have these bits of absurdity, of surrealism, we might say, not really, of like randomness in which you read about huge babies, gigantic babies wandering through the wastes or you read about an entire part of the United States turned into a giant dump, you read about a character who can levitate, these kinds of details break the realism of the novel in a way that reminds us a lot of the way postmodernisms postmodernist writers did that. And some readers don't take this very well. I, for instance, have nothing against it, but maybe that's just because I was raised on a diet of science fiction and fantasy, and I don't see that as a disturbing. But readers with a more classical, like, approach to books, an example is James Wood in a famous article, he said that these kinds of details, like, basically, like, joke with the reader, basically trick the reader, and some readers don't really like these addictions, these additions to a book like Infinite Jest with such an aim as Infinite Jest. What's your take on Infinite Jest? Do you think it's a realist novel? Did you read it as a realist novel about real people and real characters? Or like a some kind of Family Guy episode stretching throughout 1200 pages, like some sort of joke of that kind? Because another question I'm going to ask, and this is the crucial one I think about Infinite Jest, is is it a postmodern novel or not? There's a lot of disagreement on this front. Many consider it a postmodern novel, some don't. Like, if we like refer to some main theories about postmodernism, like McHale's idea that postmodern novels foreground the breaking of ontological boundaries, if you're interested about that, check my video on postmodernism. Infinite Jest is not really a postmodern novel. What do I mean? I mean that Infinite Jest never reveals to you that it is a novel, never, for, never foregrounds its fictionality, N to put it very bluntly, never ruins the pleasure of reading 
to the reader. That's, I think, the reason why it's so popular, way more popular than books like Gravity's Rainbow or other postmodern masterpieces, even much shorter, even more enjoyable in some ways, like Calvino's books, for instance. Theoretically speaking, if you're a reader who's just interested in reading for the plot and to get enjoyment from a book, you can read Infinite Jest and get kicks out of it. There is one crucial exception that is, I think is worth mentioning, which is that the book foregrounds its own fictionality in one crucial way, which is that Infinite Jest, the book, is in many ways Infinite Jest, the film you have been reading about for 200 pages. Infinite Jest in the novel is a movie that is so addictive, so good that you can't stop watching it, you can't stop enjoying it, and eventually you die out of the uh, the hydration, I think, because you just keep watching till you die, till you drop. And isn't the book exactly that, in a way, because the book is such an enjoyable, such an addictive experience that once you've finished it, and it was my experience, it was many readers' experience, let, tell, let me know about yours, once you've finished it, you just crave for more. And many readers, many readers immediately go back to the beginning because they want to reread it. And that's crazy for a 1200 page book, but you want to do that. And the book, the, my point is that the book is structured exactly to make you feel that way. That's my main issue with Infinite Jest. The, the sheer fact that crucial information about the ending of the novel, crucial facts about the plot, are actually told, are actually given in the beginning, in the first part of the novel, is actually there, I think, because the author, uh, Black Wallace, wanted you to finish it and then to go back to the beginning. To create this circular structure in which you're basically could cool, keep on reading the book uh, like until you drop. You could like enter in this loop and keep reading the book uh, like infinitely. Because it's so good, yeah, because it's so good on a level of plot and characters and because it's interesting and because you want to know what happens. In that way, in that front on that front, that's exactly just like the movie. Which is an incredibly problematic thing for a book that's supposed to be about sincerity, about reconnecting with the reader, about sharing a, a sincere experience with another human being, and that just tricked you into falling prey of the same thing that it problematized for 1200 pages. Is Infinite just nothing but a colossal joke, actually? Is it just the literary equivalent of stop punching yourself? Because, I mean, I think it is structured, in many ways, to be exactly that. Because the other alternative is that it's, like, its only problem is that it is so good that against its own goodwill, it ends up being addictive as it's supposed not to be. And I don't believe that. I believe the first, like, the first choice is actually more realistic. But what's your take on the book? Did you take Infinite Jest as just as a joke? Did it take this thing that it made you an addict like part of the beauty of the book? Did you feel tricked? Have you ever reflected about the book in this way? Let me know guys. Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this video and please check that bibliography in the description box, you're going to find quite a few interesting links, quite a few interesting essays and books um, like uh, Stephen Burns' Reader's Guide is extremely short and if you want a more like actually serious reader's guide to the book, do purchase it or like get it wherever you can and read it. Let me know if you'd like me to talk about other books in this way, to like film other reader's guide and in that case let me know what books you'd like me to film a reader's guide about. Let me know what you feel about this video, what you feel about all of the ideas I've talked about, let me know what you want in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching once again guys, I will see you in the next one, bye guys.